Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, this is Think Tech Global on a given Friday afternoon at uh, 5. And we are uh, doing our regular show. We do a regular show every few weeks with Karthiki Mishra, who's a student at the School of Management Science in Varanasi, India, which is not too far from the, what, the Nepal border, uh, and which is on the Ganges River. And he talks to us and tells us the, uh, the student, uh, the Indian student perception of what's going on in the world. He is very worldly and uh, compliments to his school for that. Uh, so, Karthiki, welcome back to the show. It's nice to talk to you again. Thanks for having me today. Absolutely. So we, we, uh, we have agreed to talk about three things today. Uh, one is the North Korea summit, which is very interesting, and let's get yes. your views of that. <clears throat> one is the G7 meeting, uh, which uh, the president attended uh, just a few days ago. And the other is the uh, Shanghai uh, uh, corporate summit uh, in China that's also very interesting. And I am so interested in trying to find out exactly what you what you feel about these things. Let's let's tackle uh, the North Korean uh, summit first um, because that has implications uh, heard around the world. Uh, so what uh, what do you think? What do, what do your peers think? What is what does India think of what happened here at the North Korea summit between Trump and Kim? Uh, certainly, everyone is positive about this summit. Uh, each and every world leaders have given their views about it. And certainly, India has given positive feedback about uh, this uh, particular summit, which took place in Singapore. And Indian government has welcomed the actions of both North Korea and President Trump. And I personally see it as a different, uh, victory, or I would say, achievement of Donald Trump as a president uh, in Indian uh, tackling the problem of North Korea. And certainly, I can say that uh, this summit will yield visibility for North America, uh, sorry, America and North Korea, and as well as the rest of the world. Well, they, they struck an agreement on a two-page document, uh, which was very nonspecific. Uh, and they spent 20 minutes together, um, and neither one of them speak the language of the other, I don't think. Uh, so what do we have here? You know, what kind of moment does this agreement have in, in terms of an agreement that actually you know, will go forward, will be implemented? Uh, what what uh, do you think, what does the Indian people around you think about the um, you know, implementation, implementability, if you will, of this agreement? Uh, okay, I personally think that uh, this agreement talks about two things. Uh, first thing is complete denuclearization of uh, North Korea. And second thing is the U.S. would stop uh, taking exercises, military exercises with South Korea. These are two goals of this uh, summit, I believe. And certainly, this thing will bring positive impacts in the eastern areas of Asia. And secondly, I think very positively about this because India has diplomatic ties with North Korea since uh, 1973. Uh, we completed 45 years of diplomatic relationship with uh, North Korea. Uh -huh. And uh, before, before this summit took place, one very interesting thing is that uh, our foreign minister, Julia Foreign Minister uh, General V.K. Singh, uh, made a visit to North Korea. And it was the first visit, I would guess, in first 20 years by an Indian minister level person visiting North Korea. And uh, it yielded positive results in India also. India is having a keen interest in North Korea. So the president, uh, President Trump, has said that um, th this is the new age and that there's an age of now of peace to follow uh, between uh, the U.S. and North Korea. Um, do you accept that? Do you believe that? Or do you think that's merely for public relations? Uh, I believe it's possible, but uh, somehow trusting the Korean regime is a bit difficult. We can say that in long run it may function well, but we have to see the actions of North Korea. What would be <coughs> they doing for keeping their part of the agreement? And as well as one thing I would like to point out that uh, Trump, President Trump is a bit instable in his 
foreign policy or diplomatic policy as we can see. Uh, and that's something which troubles me. It depends upon President Trump. If he gets in a mood swing, he can do something uh, like Iran deal, walking out of Iran deal with North Korea, which can again uh, raise the tension between two nations. So I can say a uh, trust issue is something which US and North Korea should work on. Hmm. Well, you know, uh, we've seen him change his mind. We've seen more and more he becomes his own his own uh, policy uh, policy council, and uh, uh, it's it's not too important what the people around him say. It seems like and he makes his own decisions about these things. So my question to you is: uh, Do you trust him to fairly uh, implement the deal? Do you trust him to make reasonable moves going forward, or will this just be one step in a long road? toward a, um, a, a decline uh, or a re-decline of the relations between the U.S. and North Korea? It, it may happen. It depends totally upon President Trump that what decision he takes in future. But certainly I believe that uh, this step, this positive step was necessary in the present day. But one thing I would like to also point out that before this summit took place on 12th June, uh, President Trump issued a declaration of something like that, uh, stating that he will cancel the uh, North Korean summit with, in, happening in Singapore. And after reconciliation and talks with uh, North Korea, things came to line and th this summit happened. But we can certainly see that Trump is a bit unstable in his policies. First, he canceled the summit again, then summit took place. So we can conclude that uh, his decisions are quite erratic in nature. Mm -hmm. uh, how frequently he changes his opinion. So if President Trump keeps uh, one single thought in his mind and continues to work on it, and then I can say positively that North Korea would also take the actions uh, for denuclearization in the Korean Peninsula. Mm -hmm. Well, what about now? What about Kim Jong Un? Uh, he's uh, he's got a reputation of, of, of going back on his word. He's not. He hasn't been treated as trustworthy, and in fact, he's he's uh, killed a number of members of his family. And I'm and I'm wondering uh, how you feel about his um, his ability or his willingness to actually go forward on a reasonable basis um, and uh, implement the terms uh, such as they are. Uh, what what can we expect from Kim Jong Un? Uh. Certainly, Kim Jong-un is a dictator of North Korea. His family is ruling North Korea since 1950. So I can say that his, his policies are towards making North Korea a power, which could be a threat to the alliance or the allies of the United States in that area. Mm -hmm. Japan, South Korea are very key strategic partners of USA in that area. Mm -hmm. But certainly I say that uh, North Korean leader or North Korea does not have uh, the financial capacity or the economic capability to maintain a large army or maintain nuclear arsenal. Uh, it's rumored that he has six to ten nuclear weapons, but it is still rumored. We can't say with guarantee that North Korea does or does not have nuclear weapons. It is something which is only stated. No one of us has seen the weapons of North Korea. It is only by the government of Kim Jong-un that they have the nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Well, it's been said that it so would take... Say... Go ahead. Oh, sorry. It's been said that it would take 10 years to actually denuclearize uh, North Korea because there are so many installations and systems involved. Um, you know, so what is the timing? Because, because uh, it's not clear that uh, President Trump will remain in office that long. In fact, he couldn't. Um, and it's not clear whether that's a, a, a workable time limit for public interest and for the interest of the press. How, how long do you think it'll take before we know whether this is a legitimate deal and whether the parties are legitimately trying to implement it? A uh, few steps could, which I could see clearly is that uh, North Korea destroyed its uh, uh, testing facilities. So this could be a step which shows that North Korea is willing to take action to denuclearize the North Korea 
And I think it will take time. It is not an issue which will come to an end in one, two, three years, but mm -hmm. it will take time. Ten mm -hmm. years is something expected. It can take longer than that, depending upon the uh, nature of the government. So how do you feel this will affect, um, you know, uh, uh, the stability of the Korean Peninsula and South Korea? How will South Korea react to it? Uh, how will Japan react to it? And the big question, of course, huge big question, is how will China react to it? Do you have any thoughts? Do people talk about that in Varanasi? Uh, certainly, uh, something which is it is in news is North Korea. Generally, if you see an Indian news channel, uh, I can say one hour is daily dedicated to Kim Jong-un and his uh, nuclear tests and something. Generally, we mock him for doing this all. And I can say that these uh, countries, China, South Korea, and Japan, <coughs> closely related with uh, North Korea. Before the summit of 12th June, North Korean leader and South Korean leader met together. Uh, first summit between North Korea and South Korea. And first time a leader of North Korea visited South Korea and uh, signed a declaration, what we call Palm Zone Declaration, which took place. And according to this de declaration, the Korean leaders will try to uh, work together for complete denuclearization and to uh, increase the cooperation between two Koreas. And many steps are taken by the Korean governments to uh, I would say, support the peace between the nations. For example, in Winter Olympics, both the Koreas took the participation under one flag of Korea. Both North Korean and South Korean players were under one flag of Korea. So I can say that I believe that uh, North Korea will take positive action. Mm -hmm. As for Japan and China, these two nations are also very keen interest. If uh, North Korea becomes peaceful, so China can have a threat that U.S. Navy or with the station, uh, I would say, for uh, stopping North Korea may put China. Uh, it would be targeted towards China. So for, from China's point of view, it can be a bit difficult situation if North Korean problem solves. Mm -hmm. As for Japan, uh, we can say uh, if they both agree to it, North Korea and South Korea and United States, Japan will also agree to the, all the policies of U.S. Uh, making mm -hmm. the area mm -hmm. peaceful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, the big question now is uh, India. Uh, how does, how does uh, India fare? Is, is India happy with this deal? How will this affect? How will this deal affect India? India's relationships with uh, North Korea, with South Korea, with Japan, with China, and with the U.S. What's in it for India? Certainly, I can say that. Uh, we, as I said, uh, from 1973, we are maintaining full diplomatic relations with North Korea. And the, this peaceful uh, approach, this peaceful policies will increase the trade of India with North Korea. If possible in the future, if North Korea denuclearizes, the sanctions uh, placed by U.S. would be lifted. UN sanctions would be removed. This would give India an opportunity to invest in North Korea, to business with North Korea, mm -hmm. and as well as India will be able to own uh, his, its policy of act East, which seeks alliance and trade uh, between the nations of East Asia. So North Korea can be a key strategic partner for India after lifting the sanctions if denuclearization takes place. Mm -hmm. As for China, Japan, and uh, U.S., I can say that India has positive relations with each of them. So uh, North Korean relations of India, U.S., and uh, China does not affect the India's relation with the different countries. Mm -hmm. Okay, there you have it. Uh, Karki Mizra, he's a uh, student at the uh, School of um, Management Science in Varanasi, India, and he joins us by VoIP phone. Uh, we're going to take a short break and come back. We have a couple of other international issues that we want to discuss with him. We'll be right back with Karki Mishra. Do you want to be cool like me? If so, watch my show on Tuesdays at 1, called Out of the Comfort Zone. I sang this song to you because I think you either are cool
or have the potential to be seriously cool. And I want you to come watch my show where I bring in experts who talk all about easy strategies to be healthier, happier, build better relationships, and make your life a success. So come sit with the cool kids at Out of the Comfort Zone on Tuesdays at 1. See you there. Hi, I'm Bill Sharp, host of the Asian Review here on Think Tech Hawaii. Join me every Monday afternoon from 5 to 5.30 Hawaii Standard Time for an insightful discussion of contemporary Asian affairs. There's so much to discuss, and the guests that we have are very, very well informed. Just think, we have the upcoming negotiation between uh, President Trump and Kim Jong-un. The possibility of Xi Jinping, the leader of China, remaining in power forever. We'll see you then. We're back uh, with Karnaki Mitra. He's a student at the School of Management Science in Varanasi, India. He joins us from time to time talk about uh, affairs in India, but also uh, India's participation in international affairs. Uh, we've talked uh, earlier in this show about the North Korea summit. Uh, now we're going to talk about the G7, the G7 summit in Europe, uh, which, which uh, uh, President Trump attended only last week. So uh, you, you, you've read up, you know about that, you've looked at the newspapers, talked to your friends in uh, Varanasi. What do you think about the G7 summit and what happened, Karnaki? Uh, yes, I know about the G7 summit. It took place in Canada. Uh, the area is known as Chubut. Uh, Canada was the host of the G7 summit, and all the nations, Italy, Japan, United States, UK, took participation in it. And uh, they had various policies, uh, or I would say uh, uh, ideas, on how they can work together. And certainly, I can say that United States took a very drastic step uh, from President Trump, I would say, moved out of that summit before the declaration or the something was signed. And I can say that this this can lead a very, to a very big problem between the other allies of the United States. Uh, sometimes these people in France or the French media said that this is not a G7 summit. This is a G6 plus one summit because <laughs> all of these yes. Yeah, we've heard that here, too. G6 plus one. Yes. Uh, because the policies of United States are completely different and not aligned to the other members of this uh, summit. Uh, and the key areas in which this summit was working was uh, climate change, uh, developing jobs in future, and uh, building a secure world for everyone. But President Trump, uh, I would say, took a very drastic action, moved out of this summit, Stating the reason that Canadian people are, or the Canadian government is imposing 300% tariffs on the dairy products, and until and unless Canadian government reduces the tariffs on U.S. products, uh, U.S.-based dairy products, uh, Trump won't agree with them, or the G7. Mm -hmm. So uh, this can lead to a problem with the key allies of United States, which are near U.S., it can create a trade war between U.S. and the Europe or the, uh, I would say, rest of the world. And recently I read in the newspaper today that Trump put 25 percent tariffs or increased 25 percent tariffs on some products of China. Mm -hmm. And as well as uh, China has also increased 25 percent tariffs on some of the products of U.S. And if this kept on going, it can lead to a very uh, drastic trade war between U.S. and all its allies. Yes. And one thing more, in G7 summit, Trump targeted India also. It said that India puts tariffs on some of the U.S. products, which are up to 100%. Until and unless India uh, reduces those tariffs, we won't agree to the uh, trade policies of India. So he is clearly taking a policy on which Trade war could easily start. We place tariffs, uh, China pays tariffs, so this can lead to a very great problem, uh, economic crisis. None of the presidents uh, before President Trump took such drastic measures for uh, reducing the trade deficit between the nations. Mm -hmm. He said that, uh, certainly, that if these nations do not decrease the trade tariffs, we will stop trading with them. Well, it does And I don't think... They, I don't think this approach will help United States in the long run. 
Yes, I, I certainly agree. I mean, we, we've alienated uh, our trade partners, our closest allies in Europe, and in fact, uh, Canada, that's really too bad. Uh, we've imposed um, tariffs on um, people we are close with, and, um, and um, we are in effect in a trade war. Uh, and he has alienated uh, allies, strategic allies, uh, who are in a very funny spot now, and uh, especially given the Russia's uh, attempts to uh, increase its influence in, in Europe. So I guess my question for you is, what's going to happen now? What's going to happen with regard to you know, the ripple effects, Carnegie? What are the ripple effects, business-wise, between the U.S. And, and its trading partners in Europe, between the U.S. and its trading partners here in uh, North America, and for that matter, South America, and what will happen in the relationship, the trading relationship that the U.S. has with China? All of these uh, seem, uh, seem precarious right now, um, and I wonder how you see it playing out. Uh, certainly, I can say that uh, these on policies of the United States have created some problems. The world is now looking towards China. If U.S. kept on this approach of protective trade policies, people will look towards nations like India and China for them because these nations are still, compared to the United States, are ready for open business, open trade. And uh, the nations like developing nations like India, China, Russia, uh, South Africa, uh, BRICS, uh, what we call them, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, mm -hmm. and uh, these all the nations who few of them are common in SCO, which is uh, known as Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which was clearly led by Russia and China. So we can see that that world is moving from the United States to China for business, mm -hmm. if this kept on going. Well, so, so if we say that uh, the relationships, the trading relationships and the strategic relationships between the U.S. and uh, all those uh, G7 countries in Europe uh, is, uh, is at risk and uh, degrading, uh, likewise its relationship uh, with China is degrading, uh, how does that affect India? I mean, for example, if uh, Trump imposes a, a technology tax on technology products from China, uh, doesn't that give India a new advantage for the same kinds of technology products? Yes, certainly it gives advantage to uh, Indian products. But certainly Trump is not in favor of that also. Because India has a trade surplus with U.S. China has a trade surplus with U.S. Trump has targeted those nations who have trade surplus with U.S. China has a surplus with U.S. India has a surplus with U.S. So his policies are targeted towards nations who have trade surplus issues, and he wants to reduce them. The trade deficit of U.S. with, uh, I would say, uh, all the nations are around, uh, in 2017, $556 billion, in which $300 billion or something is around of, uh, China, yeah. $24, $25 billion around is with India, yeah. and Trump wants to reduce them. Uh, these uh, deficits. Well, Carnegie, uh, it, it just yes. it occurs to me that we are at risk of losing a lot of trade. We are at risk of having mm -hmm. uh, e economic downturn uh, in the U.S. and, 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 the, and certainly these other places as well. Uh, trade war in the circumstances, it sounds like it's inadvisable for everybody. But let me ask you this. You're a business student. Maybe you've thought about it. Are we at risk of a global recession? as a result of these arguments on trade wars? Yes, we can at least go to these recessions because, uh, for example, President Trump pulled out of Iran nuclear deal on 8th May. Uh, and certainly, uh, walking out of Iran deal and putting sanctions on Iran made the prices of oil go up. And the prices of oil go up means increasing of, uh, I would say, uh, all the things which are related to the oil, nations like in India and China are severely affected by such policies. It can lead to recession if these policies are kept for long. U.S. should think positively about these relationships and should work in a 
diplomatic man rather than a trade war to curb the uh, deficit between the nation. Okay, uh, gee, not, not happy news. Uh, let, me, let me move on to the third area we wanted to talk about, and that is the, um, uh, the Shanghai, uh, uh, what is it? The Sh corporate Summit. Corporate, uh, corporate Summit. Shanghai Corporate Summit, in Sh in Sh Summit in Shindao. So, uh, Qingdao, can you, uh, can you tell us what's going on, what has happened with that summit, and who has participated, and what the upshot is? Yes, it is something very interesting which I would like to tell. That it is the 18th SEO summit took place in China, the city of Qingdao, on 9th and 10th June. This whole SEO concept started in 1996. In 2001, Uzbekistan joined the SEO, and after 16 years, both India and Pakistan joined this uh, SEO as full members. In 2018, uh, Prime Minister Modi visited as the full member of SEO for the very first time in China. And this SEO basically works on increasing the cooperation between the Central Asian nations, uh, example, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, China, Uzbekistan, and Two new forces joining the SEO makes it much more legible than G7. Trump moved out of uh, this G7. China took uh, India and Pakistan as new members. So we can clearly see that that the world is moving in a, towards a very different order. India and China are now fighting forces, and if not, if G7 fails, this SCO and BRICS can be an alternative to all the nations who are, who are wanting trade uh, with Asia. Well, it's all connected, isn't it? You know, it's not uh, yes. coincidental that these three meetings have taken place all within the recent past. Um, it's not coincidental that they each have an effect on the other. And in a world that's interdependent, uh, in the words of Thomas Friedman, and flat and interdependent, um, each one of these things has an effect on the other things, and all three of them have a significant effect on the global economy. So this suggests to me, Carnegie, that you and I should be talking about this on a regular basis, and we should compare notes, not only how it is seen from India, but how it affects India, and how India reacts to it, because India is right there, you know, sort of in, in the coincidence, in the intersection between East and West. And thank you so much, Carnegie, for joining us. I'd like to get together with you again uh, four weeks from today, same time and station. I hope that's okay with you. Yes, that's fine with me, and thanks for having me for the show. Thank you, Carnegie. Aloha.